whatever other forms of social that you are doing this. Yep, you go ahead. All right, ready to go? Cool. All right, well, thank you everyone for jumping on. Um, you know, I expect more people to roll on in the next five or so minutes, but welcome to the Data Science Development Series, part three. Now, if this is your first time here, then the Data Science Development Series is a, you know, open source um, development series offered by Pandera Systems, Tech and Beer, as well as Southern Data Science Conference. Um, the purpose of the Data Science Development Series is to be able to offer a intermediate to beginner level um, introduction to the core topics within the data science field, right? So what you've missed in the first two episodes was Machine Learning 101, and last week we did <clears throat> Computer Vision 101. Now this week, I'm happy to present well, I won't be presenting, but I'm happy to share Deep Learning 101. I, for those who don't know, I'm Brian O'Connor, the Director of Data Science at Pandera Systems. I'll be hosting you know, all six sessions. Now, one thing I didn't mention was the Data Science Development Series. It's every Wednesday for six weeks. Like I said, we're in the third week. So you find us here every single Wednesday at 5.30. Next week, we have a session on natural mm -hmm. language processing. Um, search and relevance will come the following week, and then recommendation engine as well. Right, so I hope to, if you guys enjoy this session, I hope to see you back. And I, I already start to recognize some names that were here last week who were very active in the chat. So I'm excited um, that you are back. Now, just real quick again, the sponsors, Pandera Systems, who I work for. Um, Pandera Systems is a data and analytics consultancy firm. TAB is a community event where it stands for Tech and Beer, where what we do is we have these in-person um, events where you go out to a bar, you drink a few beers, you talk with the community around um, you know, technology and be able to share your experience with the community, share ideas. Um, it's a great event. And as soon as we're able to have more in-person events, we'll be sure to keep you in, in the loop with where, what locations those will be and where at. I'm personally based out of Boston, where we do events here but we do events all over the country. So, you know, if you want to put in the chat room where you're from, you know, let us know. We'll make sure to uh, keep you in mind as events are coming. And then Southern Data Science Conference, of course, which offers, you know, full day conferences for data science. Um, last year was in Orlando. Uh, it's a great event where um, you can really go and learn a lot from different panels and discussions. Our presenter on Computer Vision 101, if you were there last week, uh, he'll be doing a full day panel on computer vision. So if you really liked that last week, you know, definitely look into Southern Data Science Conference um, and, you know, sign up for that uh, session itself. So with that, I will ask you to follow us on Padera. We'll send out, we'll follow us on uh, social media. That way you could be up to speed with everything that's going on. And with that, I will introduce today's instructor, Nick the Greek, some people call him, <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll hand it off to Nick. I think. Oh. Yes, I'm not on mute anymore. Yeah. Can I share my screen? Am I free to share my screen? Yes, you are. Okay, you will stop your screen sharing. Continue. We want. Um... Hey, before while while you're sharing your screen, Nick, just so the audience knows, so you'll see that there's a chat window which we already mentioned. I, I ask that everyone kind of use the chat just to, you know, socialize, share your LinkedIn, share where you're from, talk about what you do for work, you know, kind of those type of questions, but any questions related to the content, I ask that you use the Q&A panel in the Zoom. So there'll be a Q&A session, and from there, I'll be available. Khalife, who I didn't introduce, Khalife is um, Director of Data Science at Home Depot, and he's also a founding member of the Southern Data Science Conference. So we'll be available to answer any questions, and also if the question is, relevant directly to the content, then we'll, you know, budge in and stop Nick to be able to answer that question live during his presentation. So sorry about that, Nick, but take it away. Not a problem. So I'd like to see my, my myself more like a, an old guy in a fireside and less than an instructor, to, instructor today. So um, the title is um, Deep Learning One-on-One. Uh, I'll change it a little bit and I'll ask the question, why deep learning? 
So before we start, uh, let's see who is Nick the Greek. So I'm VP of Data Science uh, for Relational AI. Um, I describe myself as a conference man. Um, I've organized a lot of conferences in the past. Uh, in the beginning around the industry, um, uh, and then uh, I've also participated and I actively organized workshops or co-organized academic workshops. Uh, something that you probably uh, realize from my background, and this is the picture of my background, that's my library. I like books and um, you're going to see a lot of books, uh, book recommendations uh, during this presentation. Uh, I, I think there's, uh, there's always, for, for everything I'm going to say, there's a book telling a story about it. Um, I also tend to identify myself as an educator. I occasionally teach at Georgia Tech, but I think uh, it's my, my philosophy in my career to work with junior people. So I, I probably, I'm proud to say that I have, uh, in the past 10 years, I had more than 30, 30 interns supervised by me. Um, and uh, this is something that I enjoy a lot. Now, I, I wanted to, since we're kind of like relaxed, um, uh, grab uh, the opportunity to uh, to comment a little bit on the tab idea, tech and beer, and um, <laughs> it's kind of interesting uh, how things are changing. Uh, uh, tech and beer is is helping us, uh, you know, socialize, uh, although we are in a social distant uh, uh, um, time right now. Um, but it's kind of interesting that uh, the beer uh, two or three hundred years ago had uh, an opposite effect. So this is a great book by Stephen Johnson, where good ideas come from, where, uh, you know, he talks about scientists in England. They used to go to a pub and after 20 or 30 minutes, they were drunk. So they didn't really have enough time uh, socializing new ideas. So science couldn't progress. And then coffee. Was, uh, became popular and coffee is a brain stimulus and all of a sudden, a sudden we saw um, an explosion of, of new ideas and uh, uh, social interaction uh, between smart people. Now I believe things have changed right now. I've seen most of my colleagues in the conferences, uh, uh, they, they have new ideas over beer or happy hour. Okay, so who is this talk for? Um, this is, uh, you know, you will find this talk interesting if you, if you are the type of a person who likes to learn by uh, examining history. So if you try to understand how we got there. Uh, I think it's particularly good for students who want to understand what changed and machine learning is not cool anymore, but deep learning is. Uh, also, if you are a manager uh, uh, who, you know, who hesitates to invest deep learning, maybe we will be able to inspire you to, to start looking at it uh, um, uh, more seriously. And, uh, you know, on the other hand, if you are a deep learning enthusiast uh, who likes to philosophize, you, you probably won't learn anything new about deep learning, but you will see it from a different, uh, from a different angle. Uh, and at last, if you're an engineer who's used machine learning and you don't really uh, um, understand it, uh, or you, you know, you wanted to go more in depth and go take the next step and jump into deep learning, I think you're going to um, find it useful. Um, <laughs> do not expect fancy graphics. Uh, lockdown has affected me as well. I think this is the first time that I wear a shirt after three months. Uh, okay, um, I live in a house with three kids uh, <laughs> and a full-time job and several other obligations. So um, I tried to, uh, to do my best. I didn't sleep last night to finish the presentation. Now, um, here are the things we're not going to talk about today. So you're not gonna learn anything about TensorFlow or PyTorch, uh, not even the, you know, the deep mathematics behind deep learning. Or, and you know, if you were hoping to learn how to code AlphaGo Zero, uh, you know, we can't do it in an hour. Well, having said that, there's, there are beautiful books uh, that you can uh, read. And of course, a lot of nice uh, uh, courses and tutorial at, uh, at Udemy or Coursera or Udacity uh, that you can take. Uh, you know, the first, in my opinion, the, the first book introduction to deep learning, it's, it's a good place to start. Now, if you, if you care more about the, the history of deep learning, uh, the deep learning revolution, it's written by the founder of NeurIPS. NeurIPS is the conference, is the AI conference, is a conference that sells out faster than uh, uh, Taylor Swift, uh, to the point that now you have to go through a, a raffle to get a ticket. 
Like the last time they had an open registration, it got sold out in eight minutes, faster than Burning Man. And if you are the type of the person who likes to uh, uh, kind of like name drop a little bit and refer to quotes, The Architects of Intelligence, a great book with uh, short uh, interviews from the um, you know, important people in artificial intelligence. So now that we, uh, we set up the expectation, if you think that this is uh, not the place, uh, you know, this is, this, it's not uh, what you were expecting, you probably wasted about 10 minutes of your time, but since the event is free, you're, you're, you know, you can leave and, um, and do something more useful <laughs> than that. Uh, if on the other hand, uh, you think that uh, it's going to be useful, let's start the, the journey. So, I always like to start uh, before the beginning of everything, and we're going to go about 10, 15 years ago uh, and see the word before deep learning. It wasn't really a particularly bad word, but it wasn't really easy. Um, there were a lot of famous algorithms in those days, and you might have heard some of them. So, you know, you know decision trees, support vector machines, naive base classifier, matrix factorization. Most of them were trying to do the same thing. They were either classifiers or uh, regressors or clustering techniques. Um, but it was really hard and you had to spend a lot of time in order to, to study them and, uh, and start using them. You know, it was, uh, it was frustrating times. That was the times that you needed a PhD to do machine learning. Uh, you needed to know uh, very, very, very strong math and uh, people were getting confused and they were kind of like lost in a sea of of mathematics and papers without being able to understand well so what's the point why do i need uh, uh, decision trees if i have support vector machines uh, and uh, you know what's the purpose of, of hidden markov models what's the difference with conditional random fields um the world was divided according to the data set so there were people that they were doing a speech only or financial data or text or images or credit score like literally you walk into a, a cs department a graduate students and they were divided into different uh, classes uh different kind of like sections and its data uh, had its own conference so there was a conference cvpr for images only you had one for medical imaging, even like for images, it was specialized inter-speech for speech and, and so on. I mean, that was the golden, uh, the golden age of, of conferencing for, for IEEE, where every, every year they will come up with a new specialized area. Okay. So, I mean, keep in mind that sometimes market really likes uh, fragmentation. Um, uh, because fragmentation creates these little pockets where you are the uh, the big boss and you have a community and you can you can make a career. Uh, to make you know to make things worse, um, it wasn't just like data and algorithms, but it was kind of like a Cartesian product of both. So there were people that they were using speed, they were working on speeds, but they were using hidden Markov model. There were other people that they were doing speeds and they were specializing in support vector machines. So that was creating a more, even more um, uh, fragmentation, okay? Uh, and it was impossible to find a common abstraction. Um, um, you know, kernel methods have different needs uh, from uh, tree-based methods. Uh, there were more than 10 different clustering algorithms, all based on different principles. Um, uh, images needed a different type of storage than time series and text you know lived in in its own different world so if you wanted to work in a specific area you had to kind of like set up a specific tool set for that and learn particular technology and particular technology to start uh, working on it so you know things were were very dull and, and why did I mention that? It's because if you can't get kind of like a general abstraction and standardization, it's very difficult to write software. Uh, where there's no abstraction, there's no software. You know, C++ was the language of choice uh, and sometimes Java, mainly C++ because computers weren't that, um, uh, you know, they weren't uh, that fast. So uh, you had to use a really fast language, but very difficult to code. 
and unfortunately, there wasn't really a universal a library um, to where you could, you know, implement all these algorithms. Uh, there were many specialized libraries. There were some, uh, you know, general purpose linear algebra libraries like uh, uh, Eigen uh, and, uh, and LAPAC, but really, really hard to work with them. Um, Scikit-learn was probably the first, uh, uh, the first attempt to uh, write some uh, uh, general uh, software, kind of like uh, try to create a library for machine learning. But the reality was like Scikit-learn uh, managed to unify the, uh, the interface. Okay, so you have the fit and predict um, no matter what algorithm. But underneath in the development, uh, there wasn't really a unified way of, of doing them. Each library was, uh, or each algorithm was written by a different person. Uh, some of them were multi-threaded, some of them were not. Uh, and I'm not, you know, right now we're talking about just writing the algorithm in a single thread. When you go to distribution, it was a, a much bigger disaster. Like, are you gonna do it in multi-threading, in Hadoop, in Spark? Uh, none of them actually managed to, to break the barrier and, uh, um, and they give us a universal uh, piece of software. Um, and whenever you were building a pipeline of data, you know, like an algorithm where you're doing clustering and then uh, you were using uh, a classifier and then you were combining two classifiers to something else, everything you would do, you know, every algorithm will have to generate data first and then pass this data to the next step. And that was making things very slow um, because it was, uh, it was using a lot of temporary data, okay? Now, another important factor that uh, you shouldn't really um, underestimate was the time that it was taking to go from a, an academic paper to production. Um, you know, usually some papers, not all of them, because that would have required a lot of time, would come up with some open source, uh, open source code uh, that most of the times was garbage because let's face it, uh, uh, you know, researchers, are great at creating algorithms, but uh, most of them didn't really have any formal education on, uh, on, on writing software or doing proper software engineering. And even if the software was good today, you know, once the student would graduate, there was nobody to support it and it would go stale. You know, so in the best case scenario, it would take at least two years from paper to working code. Uh, I wanna quote a friend of mine um, who is present in the audience um who said that he would come up with an idea and uh it would take about a year year and a half to implement it in java so they can put it into production you know by then it was uh um it was really useless uh until he convinced his company to switch to python you know that person should feel free to identify himself or herself if she or he wants to uh anyway um so, and the other thing is that even if you were writing an algorithm, um, you know, people were providing the source code. It was a nightmare to compile it on Windows, on Linux, on Mac. So it wasn't really practical that you would read a paper, you would be impressed by the results, and then you would have to, you go somewhere, download the code, try it, and, you know, get stunned. Say, you know, wow, that thing works. I can go to my boss and, and start working with it. Um, um, yeah, that was uh, that was very sad. The only case that that probably worked was if you were backed by Google or Facebook, and they would spend the resources to do that. Um, let's continue in that uh, in, in that line of thinking. Okay, so you wrote the papers. Uh, you couldn't really provide uh, very good code. Uh, the other problem is that reading those papers wasn't easy. It was really really hard. Uh, it was a lot of focus on theory, a lot of hard mathematical formalism. I just put uh, a paragraph, which is not really the most difficult you would find, uh, but uh, you know, still very discouraging. Um, and uh, translating math to, to real code required really a PhD you know, to do that, a lot of experience. I remember when I was teaching, I would tell my students that the best skill you can acquire is being able to translate a paper into, into code. Uh, because a company is in need of the new, um, the new stuff, and you should be able to do that uh, quickly and fast. That was actually, um, you might have heard that role, which is still popular, 
uh, was very well paid. It was called machine learning engineer. It was the person who was responsible for that task and the person who could understand how to tune the models. Um, also, you know, when you write things in math, you tend to hand a lot of details, um, uh, you know, either not mention them or hide them in other place that wasn't visible for everyone. Um, plus, a lot of space was devoted to, to complex derivatives. So I, I'm, I hope I painted a really dull and ugly image uh, about machine learning 15, 10 years ago. Well, despite that fact, it was still an exciting field to be because machine learning was matching and was creating impact. But it was just frustrating because unless you were at a PhD program or a master's program, you didn't have the opportunity to be part of that. So let's say you were a student uh, doing an MBA or a student doing psychology or you weren't hardcore CS person, you were feeling sad that you had to invest so much time and maybe you lost or missed the train or you didn't have the money or the time to go and pursue a PhD uh, to be part of that work. So it was like an exclusive work. In a sense, I like, you know, I have to say I enjoyed that because I was, uh, you know, part of the people who were, that they were in the club, you know, inside the top, uh, uh, the, the VIP room. Okay, I don't think that, that, but it was sad that there was a crowd outside of the, this VPI room that I wanted to get inside and they didn't know how. Okay, uh, that usually, uh, uh, that kind of discrimination is not a good thing to have in a community. And here's our first book or second book. Um, uh, if you want to read about the history of artificial intelligence, this is a great book, The Quest for Artificial Intelligence. And you will see a lot of stuff mentioned um, and I mentioned over there. Now, another great book uh, was kind of like, um, takes the, uh, the thread from where the quest of AI lives that is the master algorithm. So the master algorithm written by uh, Pedro Domingos um, is a professor at uh, UW who is now at a DE show, um, making a lot of money in the stock market. Um, he, uh, divides machine learning into five tribes. You know, he has uh, the symbolists, uh, the connectionists, the analogists, and the other two that I don't remember right now because I'm sleep deprived. Anyway, you can read the books. Uh, he's talking about uh, five, uh, uh, the five different tribes. Um, and of course, the, uh, the ones that um, uh, they survived, the ones that they won, are the connections out oh, there? Sorry. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. And the 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 logicians. Uh, I'm still missing the fifth one. So the other is the school of logic. There's another one, the fifth one. You can Google that and put it on the on the chat. So the world was divided in five tribes. And he was trying to argue that there's going to be a moment that all of them are going to be united. It really literally came a few years, like one or two years after he wrote the book. Now, among this kind of, uh, um, you know, exclusive and uh, hard to get in world of machine learning, we had the rise of data science. Okay. So data science, you know, started becoming a thing uh, in the first decade of 2000. Um, and uh, if I had to describe it, it's a collection of hacks that work. Okay, I'm saying that in a positive way. Don't forget, I'm the VP of data science. I'm not trying to undermine myself. Um, and uh, so people just, you know, grab things that are working from uh, machine learning, from databases, from systems, they put them together and uh, they started producing value. And then, uh, uh, you know, really high impact business value. Uh, companies were built uh, based on data science and they started making a, a lot of money. And uh, around that time, Kaggle was, uh, uh, was founded. Uh, I'm pretty sure everybody knows Kaggle. If you don't know, it's a great site for hosting data science competition. And it was kind of like the first attempt of democratizing machine learning. So they would say, well, look, we do have these libraries that they sort of work. And we're gonna teach you some recipes about how to use them to actually solve problems. Treat them as a black box. They're a little bit messy, but they try to put an order into things. And a lot of people have learned data science, but just going to Google and uh, Kaggle and reading um, solutions of existing um, 
uh, competitions uh, and you know they become quite sophisticated but that came at a great cost at a great cost data science brought a winter uh, and you know uh, some people might disagree but it brought the winter of simplicity so i kind of avoided to put quotes of some famous people i didn't want to put them on the spot but you can find them uh, on on youtube youtube videos you can find them on blog posts where um, you know data scientists start making a lot of money, easy money, and start behaving irrationally and, and counterproductively. So uh, for about uh, um, a, decade, a decade, they would preach about simplicity. They said, "Oh, you know, forget about fancy machine learning models. All you need is a logistic regression or a decision tree. Uh, just give me more data. Don't give me more algorithms or fancier algorithms. Uh, you know, data is all you need." And um, they were also becoming very, some become very arrogant to uh, researchers in the universities. So you're just doing theory, you know, your stuff doesn't work. Uh, and um, uh, by the way, uh, you'll see them right now vouching about deep learning. Most of them, uh, if you go back to conferences in uh, 2015, 2014, 2016, you will see them being very uh, derogatory about deep learning. Um, uh, so I actually didn't like that. It was a period that I was organizing conferences and I was a bit annoying. I preferred to kind of like stay on the side of writing uh, 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 algorithms or writing code during this winter uh, until we actually, um, you know, we got into that paper. I think this is 2013, I believe. So I'm pretty sure most of you have read about this paper. That's, uh, and, I, and I call over here, the cats are raising the bar. And um, it was that paper that was published by uh, Google. And uh, you will see here, uh, Jeff Dean and Andrew NG that I'm pretty much, uh, most of you would have heard. They're kind of like um, deep learning celebrities that uh, they saw that uh, something was moving or something was happening in deep learning. And, um, uh, they ran an experiment. Basically, they used a, a whole data center to analyze YouTube videos, and they realized that uh, you know deep learning all of a sudden started recognizing uh, on its own uh, cuts from YouTube videos. Uh, you know the story is very well known, and that kind of like um, uh, sets a, 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 a crack on the timeline uh, where people start paying more and more attention to deep learning. Okay, so let's see, you know, what is this deep learning about, the deep learning workflow, as I call it. So eventually, you know, deep learning uh, is uh, um, like the, uh, uh, the standard uh, table of, of uh, chemical uh, elements. Uh, it put things into an order and uh, it basically made machine learning um, or AI look like Legos, okay? It simplified, it unified, and eventually it democratized, you know. So all of a sudden, that door that was separating the crowd from the VIP room with the celebrities kind of like collapsed. And people that, um, uh, you know, didn't even have college education um, started, uh, uh, you know, creating impact and coding and generating solutions and apps uh, and models in, in deep learning. There's this uh, a famous ballerina that she became a Google uh, resident. For those of you who don't know, uh, Google and now Facebook and other techniques, they have this residency um, program where you go and you spend a year, you know, solving problems at Google. So you're kind of like a mentee over there. Um, you get a mentor and it's, it's, sometimes it's worth more than a, a master's degree if you have a, you know, one year spent as a resident at, at Google. Okay, so um, there is this great podcast. Uh, it's a bit old. It's from 2015, but it's um, um, it's very informative. That's where I took that uh, the um, the title, the Legos of AI, uh, why deep learning is like building with Legos. Uh, by the way, you can find a lot of talks by Nando. Nando is a great speaker. Um, he's now at uh, DeepMind. Okay, so you know. Let's see some facts over here. 
you probably, you know, if you know something about machine learning, you know that uh, a very popular learning algorithm is, is gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. And in order to do gradient descent, you need the derivative. So in 2008, somebody asked at a blog, he wrote a blog post actually, why machine learning re researchers don't use automatic differentiation? Now, you know, if you don't know automatic differentiation is um, uh, uh, and, uh, a very uh, uh, prestigious um, and well-established research area in applied mathematics has been there for 30, 40 years. They have their conferences. Uh, it's, it's not easy, um, but it's very practical. It's been there, but for some reason, um, uh, you know, people in machine learning uh, wouldn't really use uh, automatic differentiation. It's as if you know you were refusing to use a calculator and you wanted to do all the calculations by hand. That's exactly actually that's exactly what they were doing. You know, you had a, a something that could do computations for you, and uh, um, you're not using it. So he asked that question, but he didn't really get an answer. That's the funny thing. Nobody really paid attention. You know, my answer is that you know I think people didn't know, or they preferred to. Uh, um, to actually do the derivations on their own and justify five years in a PhD program and uh, fill papers, uh, pages in their papers. Um, you know, there was kind of like a facade over there, a typical argument that, um, uh, well, uh, manual derivatives, as we spelled that over here, are uh, much, uh, you know, when you write a manual, it's much faster. Um, well, it's kind of like the same, in, in my opinion, uh, silly argument anymore that you know oh you have to write things in assembly uh, because if you write them with a compiler it's not as efficient as, a, as an expert can do it yeah it can be true in some cases uh, but you're definitely uh, hurting productivity over here so again why is differentiation so important before deep learning there were too many learning algorithms you know gradient descent was a popular one but it wasn't the only one okay now we use only this one, the stochastic gradient descent. Some variants, but it doesn't matter. It's just like one thing. So by just you know uh, uh, using one uh, uh, learning or inference, whatever you know, a learning algorithm, uh, you create one requirement, uh, which is that everything has to be differentiable or almost differentiable. If there are some points like the famous ReLU where uh, things are not differentiable. Uh, and you can use something proportional to that, it's still fine. Uh, now, it's very, it's, it's possible to put, you know, a lot of components that they are differential, com compose them together and, uh, um, and create complicated models and functions. Um, and uh, now you can train it because now when I have a very complicated expression, I can compute the derivatives and I can write, um, I, can, I can run gradient descent. So kind of like already I gave away the next thing, which is compositionality. Compositionality is, is, is a great thing. Uh, it's, it's, a big, uh, it's a big advantage. You know, um, if you think about it, you see compositionality is, um, is a property that uh, you see them in any advance of intelligence. Like for example, the language, has this feature. You start with letters, letters make words, words make sentences, sentences make text, uh, you know, and then text uh, can make a, a lot of things as well. You can keep combining, you know, text can make a novel, novel make, a, 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 you know, an art area, or they can make a science section, and you can build on top of that, okay? And there's plenty of, of examples where uh, being able to, DNA, another thing, you know, you start with five elements and you compose, you can make complicated things. And, um, you know, everything starts with this simple uh, architecture that I'm pretty sure even if you don't know anything about deep learning, uh, you must have seen that. As one of my biggest uh, um, difficulties, I feel like people have been exposed to deep learning from so many uh, uh, sources these days that um, I'm pretty sure nobody came here without knowing anything. So you get your input, you multiply your inputs with a vector, with, uh, uh, with weights, then you sum them and then you pass them through a function nonlinear, a sigmoid, a relu, whatever, like uh, uh, something that is nonlinear. 
Okay. And then uh, you start uh, combining them and you put them in different layers. And now every layer is learning something more complicated. This was inspired by uh, the way that your neurons, uh, the neurons uh, work in your brain. Um, I'm not going to spend more, more time on that. Uh, this is the main idea. I start with a fundamental block and I keep repeating it. I keep repeating it horizontally and uh, uh, sorry, vertically and horizontally in two dimensions. And these things can build pretty much, you know, any, any learning machine uh, you want. Now, as long as everything is continuous and differentiable, there's no limit. Um, so you see the VGG19 was uh, a, a very um, popular network. You, you might remember it. I, I think Matthew mentioned that last week. I had 19 layers. Uh, and then people went to 13 layers, uh, 34 layers. There's even networks with a thousand layers. Uh, actually, we don't go that uh, that deep, uh, that deep anymore. Okay. Now, um, you know, here was a problem. You know, you can build very uh, deep networks, and you can use traditional uh, automatic differentiation. But automatic differentiation indeed produces slow code, you know, if you use it out of the box. There was this algorithm back in the 80s uh, that uh, by, by Jeffrey Hinton and, uh, and, and Jan LeCun, it's called backpropagation, that basically says that if I have computed the derivative over here uh, at this stage, I can reuse it to compute it over here as well. So um, it was a clever trick of reusing computations if you want. So you can compute the derivative very fast. And if you're trying to understand what, what is this thing, what, what do you mean by derivative? Like if you just see uh, a neural network um, completely as a flow diagram, neural network is nothing but just like a flow of information, okay? From left to right, when you are predicting something and when you are learning is from right to left okay so neural network is you know deep learning is all about flow of information and uh, you try to create paths of going from the input to the output and uh, you start with all possible paths and, and you kind of like prune them in the beginning but the way you're building this path basically defines uh, how the, the network behaves so imagine like when you're building a city and in the beginning it's empty and you start putting buildings and then you start connecting the buildings with the roads. The way that you connect the buildings with the roads and where you're placing the buildings defines what, how the city functions. And it might sound very simplistic, but deep down, this is, these are the same principles. You can build um, a neural network that way as well. It's just that it takes time and it might not be that efficient. But, uh, and, you know, all of a sudden you get a building that gets a lot of traffic and you have to create another avenue or a bypass to get there or to get through there and pass information over there. Okay, so that's kind of like a way of thinking about it. Now, <laughs> let's go back to, I, I've left you with some questions. I said before that um, deep, you know, data science didn't really like deep learning. Um, uh, I, I need to answer why why deep learning wasn't embraced by data science. And the truth is that, um, you know, deep learning in the beginning was, was very slow. It was converging very slowly. And we didn't really know how to tune uh, uh, the model, okay? Um, we didn't have GPUs. And uh, don't forget, I mean, again, this is what I do in my everyday life. Data science, if there's one, thing to know about it is that there's always a budget there's a time constraint and a money constraint which means that you know uh, i've been in a, in, a, in, a, in research before research you get a lot of runway you get a lot of you know resources time to think in data science you have to deliver results very quickly and add a budget okay so you don't really have that time uh, experimenting and tune it now what would happen is that your boss will come with some data and say well build the model for me you would use a shallow model and say, 
a decision tree actually boost. You could get results in a few hours because it was running fast. And if it wasn't perfect, you could iterate on that very quickly, you know, create different features, uh, uh, you know, change the hyperparameters. So, you know, now, and then you were going to a deep learning model in a few hours, you had nothing. Maybe if you were lucky, we, you had run one iterate, you know, a few iteration or one pass over the data, but there's so many parameters to be tuned that the results most likely would have looked bad. And so let's say that if, if a deep learning with the computational resources of that time would take one week uh, and the results could have been better actually than uh, the decision tree, you would never have seen that because in a few hours, maybe a day, you would have something that it was working and good enough and you would never spend that time to do it. Same thing happened, for example, for images. And, uh, um, and it's not like for those of you that uh, uh, follow the, uh, you know, you might have heard the story of ImageNet. I don't have slides about that, but I can mention that. So ImageNet was a competition about uh, uh, predicting labels for images. And for several years, people were fighting to do that with uh, manual uh, uh, feature engineering. They were slowly, slowly decreasing the error. And all of a sudden, you know, deep learning, uh, you know, took the error from, I don't know, 30% to 15%, something radical like that. 10% that using was unheard of in one year. But the thing was that, you know, that competition was an academic competition. And once people find, you know, past the threshold of resources they needed, you know, they got a GPU or a fast enough computer, they could let it run for uh, a sufficient time and get the results. Because the, the exact same network existed, you know, many years before it actually won the competition. So at last data science, um, uh, um, you know, data science was looking for low hanging fruits. Um, uh, deep learning was good for the, you know, uh, the higher hanging fruits. So when we ran out of low hanging fruits, then they shifted their attention to more complicated algorithms and uh, they actually managed to, uh, to find practical uh, applications. And then all of a sudden, everybody became a deep learning enthusiast. So uh, just to give you an idea, back in 2010, uh, you know, you could use one gigabyte of data and you would produce a lot of 10 megabytes. Now, 2020, probably your data, you know, it's not 10 megabytes, maybe it's 100 or 200 megabytes, but it can easily produce uh, uh, one gigabyte uh, size of a model. Uh, in some cases, I just want to emphasize this since I've kind of like uh, hinted about AlphaGo Zero and I, I feel uh, uh, guilty that I'm not going to teach you how to do it because it's really exciting. And, you know, sorry if I made the assumption, but AlphaGo Zero uh, was this program for those who don't know that um, uh, DeepMind created and they managed to beat the champion of Go. Again, I don't believe you, you know, most of you have heard about it. It's, uh, it's everywhere. You know, even in tabloids, even in, uh, uh, in any type of, of media. So in AlphaGo Zero, actually you have a zero megabyte data set because you don't have any labeled data. All you have is an algorithm uh, that knows how to, knows the rules of Pong and then you have system playing against each other and, uh, uh, and they create agents that uh, can be quite sophisticated. Uh, unfortunately, we're not gonna talk about reinforcement learning uh, in this talk, but, um, uh, you know, I don't, maybe it's part of the, the series or we should put it in the part of the series. <laughs> hey, Nick. So, yes. I'm just going to jump in because we do have two questions. I think now will be a good time to take them. So I can read them out for you. So the first one is <sighs> Vivek has asked about uh, interpretability and explainability of deep learning. He hears it could be an issue. So he wants to know your opinions on that. And then another question that might just be easier to answer right now. Daniel asks, um, you did mention a name of a person who worked at DeepMind. What was the name of that person? That was Nando De Freitas. It was, uh, if you go back to the slide that, uh, you know, I just started and said, you know, uh, deep learning, the Legos of AI. And I believe I'm going to send you the slides. You're going to share them. But yes. the video is going to be there. Okay. Um, that was Nando De Freitas. And, you know, it's your lucky day, uh, Vivek, because uh, the last minute I decided to include my slides about interpretability and explainability about deep learning. So actually, I have a section uh, on that. Great. Okay. Okay. So uh, I hope I won't disappoint you. <laughs> so um, one of the things that, uh, you know, I mentioned before that, and I keep saying that deep learning 
uh, was um, a technique that was like a revolution because it standardized everything. And that was because, um, you know, you remember I said at the beginning that, um, uh, you know, you were a speech researcher or an image researcher or a medical image researcher or a financial data or seismic data. And they had their own algorithms, their own conf conferences. Now, you know, all of them are using the exact same uh, uh, networks. So once you solve the problem of time series in general, like uh, speech, you can go and apply it to time series data. You can go the exact same network. So what happened is, and, and I had a slide, I, I think I, I, I skipped it. Um, right now, there's only two or three conferences like ICML, ICLR, and uh, NeurIPS. These are the conferences that they easily publish uh, among three of them, let's say four to 5,000 papers, maybe 6,000 if you can't count the, uh, uh, the, the workshops and combined, if you, if you were opening the registration, they can easily get, uh, you know, 30, 40,000 people, hardcore uh, researchers. So, um, and we're gonna see right now uh, how uh, deep learning did that, how it unified everyone by just putting these Legos uh, together. I was one of the uh, of the biggest uh, breakthroughs that you didn't really have to be a, a, a super duper domain expert and know the little details of mechanics. Like I was doing speech in the beginning of my PhD and we had to model the vocal tract and the teeth and the tongue and put some, uh, uh, you know, fluid dynamic equations. Well, right now you don't have to do that stuff. You know, the, you know, the, the network is is learning on its own. So that was a very big thing. And, and yeah, how it works. We're not gonna have the, um, the, uh, the, the time to go through these uh, uh, blocks. Uh, maybe I should put transformers over here, but LSTM, for example, is, is a network that it's a sequential network that can take uh, you know, text or logic or anything that's a sequence. And it will convert that to a continuous vector. Now, the MLP, I just forgot about that. This is the multi-layer perception, okay? This is the most well-known network. And again, the LSTM is a variation of this one. Uh, I got plenty of slides. We, we, can, we, we can do more on that, but uh, think about that. I keep adding um, many, many layers depending on the how many time steps that I have over here. Um, convolutional networks, which again, uh, you probably heard of them last week. Um, I don't want to repeat, Matthew mentioned that they use for images. They take images, they convert them into a vector. So think about any modality of data. You can pass them through a network that is not very different from MLP, and it, it can connect them, it can create a vector out of them. Now, you might be, that, that process, we call it embedding, and you might be, you know, wondering, why is this so important? And I'll tell you exactly right now, is because, um, if you um, convert everything into a vector, I can put all these vectors in the same database on the same surface. And I can start, you know, running nearest neighbor questions. So if I take, you know, an image and I create an embedding, uh, a vector, and then I say, well, um, uh, you know, what is this image uh, uh, showing? Uh, then I can find another image that it's labeled. I can say, oh, it's a car, okay, or it's a horse, or it's a dog. Uh, and I could also take my text and embed it over there. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the image is close to uh, something that says it's a car. So I can associate it with the car. Now, so uh, you, I can give you an image and find the best text that describe it or the other thing. I can give it a text and, and find the best image. And to be honest, in order to do like that, you don't even have to know how to train a neural network. There are pre-trained neural networks that you can take them, you can fit the image. You really need to need to know some minimal Python to do that. It will compare them, you know, to, so let's say you are a, an old school machine learning guy that really, really knew well how to use um, nearest neighbors or decision trees. You can just take a network take your data, convert them into these vectors and just feed them into you know, a nearest neighbor classifier. And immediately you can associate text with images or images with sound or whatever you want. Like you can really fuse the data. 
Now, um, this is a very well-known paper from the show and tell from Google. Uh, and in fact, you can actually do uh, what I described before end-to-end -end differentiably, you know? So basically you have a convolutional network that takes an image, it creates a vector, and that vectors go inside an LSTM that you don't really need to know. An LSTM can either read text or generate text. The same thing, the convolutional network, you know, if I put a vector over here, it can generate an image. If I put an image over here, it will generate a vector. So that's another beauty about neural networks. Now they can work and we're gonna see them later on um, uh, in, in two different modes, you know. I give you something as an input and I get a response. I give you an intermediate representation on the right and it can generate an image. So uh, if you can pay attention in this one, I can give, uh, just keep in mind, it's just like designing a workflow. I'm taking that image and that image generate text. I can do the, you know, the same network, you train it once. You can then take the, uh, the text and, you know, run it in the reversed order, it generates an image. And these are some examples over here from the auto captioning and the reverse thing, you know, image description. Okay, now let's go back to the software because I described all these things and I, and I just said that's really easy to say you, you need, we only need Python. What, what happened like, you know, uh, Joshua Benzio at uh, University of Montreal, uh, was kind of actually the first one that uh, showed that everything can be automated and created a library called Fiano. And then Google, you know, got inspired by that library and created PyTorch. Uh, sorry, TensorFlow, and then Facebook created PyTorch, and uh, Google bought Keras and put it in TensorFlow, but Keras is even a higher level, even an easier way of, of writing deep learning code. Now, abstraction here works like a charm. You know, it's fully declarative. You're just saying what you want to do. It derives the derivatives and the training and all that complicated stuff are completely hidden away from you. Okay, um, it's so easy within hours, you can actually do amazing things. You can do things that research labs like uh, Bell Labs and MIT would require, you know, uh, thousands of hours of super talented and high IQ people to do 20 years ago. Uh, I can point you to presentation by IBM where the director of research for IBM said, I never thought that in, in, in my life I would see this problem solved because he had the experience of, of how difficult that was. Uh, now, um, in the past years, um, uh, it becomes, um, you know, gradual easier to write code. Uh, and, okay, we have another typo. The nice thing about this code is that it's Python and it's highly portable. In fact, you can write it in TensorFlow and you can run it on your cell phone. You can run it on a data center. Um, and of course that has an immediate effect, which is, you know, right now from papers to production, it takes days. In fact, most of the conferences require from you to submit the code so people can check your results. And that code is fully functional because all the important mechanics are maintained by Google or by Facebook, okay, the core. It's like, you know, you write a SQL query you don't worry about uh, an Oracle database. If somebody gives you a SQL query, you know you can write it on Oracle or, or BigQuery. You know, there's somebody maintaining the hardcore, uh, uh, you know, uh, software underneath. And what is really beautiful is that uh, you don't really have to read complicated mathematics. Now, this is from a paper that uh, uh, generates recommendations in YouTube. And I think some of you might already be able to follow, but that's the exact algorithm. It says that, you know, we somehow take embeddings, which you get them from this magical network that I said before, you can find them, you can download a network to create these embeddings for you. And then you fill them into an MLP and then you run a nearest neighbor. Once you take uh, a few hours of any deep learning course, uh, this, uh, the, uh, you know, this vocabulary will be, you know, very familiar uh, to you. So that was uh, an amazing thing that has significantly increased the productivity, which means that whatever Google is doing, you know, today, you can have it in your company tomorrow. Okay, that transfer of knowledge, it's, it's extraordinary. Um, and again, I, I was actually a co-organizer on this workshop. 
uh, reproducibility made possible. Okay, before in research, uh, I know a lot of your students, people would make claims, but nobody, you know, it was very hard to reproduce the results if you had to uh, rewrite the code in C++ or spend all this time to rerun it. You know, in general, uh, you know, from a, from a theory perspective, if there's something that you have to keep in mind is that deep learning is pretty good for combinatorial problems. These are some typical combinatorial problems of, uh, you know, running shortest paths or finding the, um, uh, the convex hull. Um, uh, you know, deep learning does this pretty fast. The problem is nobody knows why. Okay, this is still an open problem. Uh, but it solves hard problems, solves problems in physics, in chemistry, in biology, even for COVID right now, the protein folding is based on some uh, uh, pretty big deep learning and networks. So, you know, in the last, uh, according to my time, you know, I think we have five, but we started late. I think I have nine more minutes. Uh, I'll, I'll try to go through some of the new horizons that, uh, um, deep learning has opened. And the very first one is, uh, uh, you know, transfer learning, and then we're gonna see interpretability. So, you know, Inception V3 is a massively pre-trained uh, uh, neural network, okay? Google has done it. Don't try to do this at home. Um, it's probably gonna cost you about a million dollars to do that in, in cloud time. Uh, it's really expensive to do it, but they've taken, you know, hundreds of thousands of images, maybe millions of images, um, where they try to predict about a thousand different categories. Okay. Now, what happened is that, um, uh, yes, millions of images and thousand categories. Um, now, if, sorry, if you wanted to train your own, Deep learning classifier, let's say your company is making shoes and you want to try to give given an image to identify the style or the class of shoes. You can just take this pre-trained network, cut it, and then use these features to retrain your own network by just putting a logistic regression. This has to do that what I described before as embeddings. Like, you know, you can take pre-trained networks that can take images or text or whatever, you know, this network is doing and bringing down to a set of numbers that you can then use uh, in order to train your own model. Um, so this has tremendous value. And again, remember, since, you know, everybody is talking about democracy these days and, and giving access and opportunities to people, deep learning is giving opportunities to everyone. I think, you know, uh, I said, I belong to that exclusive club, but I'm so happy to see people, you know, that they are high school students, that they didn't have money to go to college, you know, getting jobs and making money, um, good money by utilizing this technology. There's nothing more beautiful by giving knowledge and, uh, and tools to the people to have a better life. Okay. So, you know, the, uh, deep learning is producing um, uh, some nice results, but, you know, as our friend Vivek asked, uh, I mean, how much can I trust these results, okay? And um, can I really understand what is going underneath? I mean, you've been telling us about this beautiful black box, but it's black box, okay? Is there anything I can do? to find out uh, why it's producing. And there's two papers over here, the Why Should I Trust You? It's called the, the Lime Algorithm. Um, uh, okay, and there's the streak. It says my group is not really my group, it's my friend Alex's, Alex Dimakis, UT Austin. We've done a lot of trainings together. I copied his slides. I got code, okay, of oh, plagiarism over here. <laughs> not plagiarism, we, we do the trainings together. We share slides. Um, so here is a problem, you know, uh, when they trained um, um, the ImageNet, ImageNet was giving very good examples and um, they were trying to understand why. And what was happening is that, uh, you know, when we give a Husky, they would just try 
um, and see which parts of the, you know, the, the neurons go all over the pixels and they would see which neurons were going to fire the most. So they will just say any neuron that uh, the, the output is less than this threshold, set it to zero. And this is how they would see what the network is doing. And surprisingly, although you would have expected, you know, the algorithm to look at the nose, the ears, the algorithm had learned that um, this is a husky because it was looking at the snow. Because, you know, where do you find huskies? You find huskies uh, in, in places with snow. So the, the algorithm, the, the network was actually cheating, you know. Uh, it was actually cheating a lot and it was looking at the wrong things. And this is something that you should also keep as, you know, you should learn about machine learning in general. Uh, machine learning is like the lazy student, you know, who studies only the tests and not, all, you know, not the book. Like if you want to excel at an exam, I'm pretty sure you are talking to smart students over there and you are lazy, you don't want to read, you just take past exams, you train yourself um, uh, and, um, and you can score really well. And then you know nothing about the subject. You know, deep learning can be, uh, can be like that. Um, and you know, the problem is that we cannot trust the model uh, if, if we don't know how it works. Uh, you know, this is called because a lot of people can use uh, adversarial techniques or it can make mistakes because it's looking at the wrong things. Um, um, so, uh, you know, for example, a malware uh, had an excellent accuracy over a train and test split uh, with true holdout by just checking if the code uh, 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 comments. So, for example, if, if a software had comments, you knew that most likely it wasn't malware. And, and, but that's not, you know, it's, it's a clever trick, but it's a trick that, uh, you know, can easily be uh, evaded because once the, the malware uh, authors realize that you're using that, uh, they would just start adding comments into their, um, uh, into their code so that they can fool you. So you need things that they are robust. So, um, uh, so what's happening right now, the idea uh, of, of, of streak is that you start taking segments of the, um, uh, of the image, so you break the image into, uh, into segments uh, and you fit it, these segments into your black block classifiers and you find the regions that uh, maximize the likelihood, so give you the best score of being the rows. And, um, once you do that with uh, uh, with Lime, uh, and, and I think Alex here is trying to advertise his method, uh, you see, for example, that um, um, the Lime algorithm gets fooled and uh, is looking at the sky because you know flowers are usually at the sky, where you know his algorithm behaves better and it really looks at the the leaves and the and the actual roses in order to understand it. So again, the, the way that you gain interpretability is by, uh, you know, evaluate your interpretability is you are trying to fool your classifier. And in some cases you pass this uh, fooling or attack mechanism during your training to make it robust. Okay. So you start, you know, taking your roses and you put them on settings that you, they would never gonna be. Like for example, the Husky, you take the husky and you're just changing the background and you put it like in the desert, you put it inside a house so that you are actually pushing your algorithm to learn the right features. Uh, and kind of like another example over there, kind of like demonstrating that, uh, uh, you know, the algorithm is, is, is giving, is looking at the right places. Um, I just wanted to mention just because I've worked on interpretability and trust and reproducibility, that in, in some cases, uh, you know, reproducibility is another form of trust. Um, it is possible that if you can't reproduce the, the experiments in different settings, it's kind of like the same thing, that you cannot trust it. And you also need to know uh, whether your model is fair, okay? Again, we're living times of, uh, of you know, um, high protest for injustice, but, um, you know, for example, in financial models, uh, uh, you're not allowed to look at uh, um, the zip code when you are going to give a loan because the zip code can be associated with, uh, with race or, or income. 
And in some cases, you know, bias is not easy to, to take away from, uh, uh, from models because there are other proxies. So for example, um, uh, if, if we want to make, like for example, uh, it is required that you're not allowed to discriminate in terms of women. So you cannot really put the gender into your classifier, okay, looking at the mom. But um, uh, there might be other features like the car that you're having. Uh, let's say uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a minivan compared to something else that can, you know, typically uh, a mother at the age of 40, you know, drives a minivan, I guess. And, and, and that way you can use proxy variables that although you're not really trying, you know, you're not explicitly saying that I'm putting the gender or the race, there are other features that they can be equivalent to that, okay? So debiasing a model is, is a very hot and active topic of research. And especially after the recent events, it uh, becomes even, even more uh, important. So the good news is that the machine learning and deep learning society has actively uh, been working on that, um, you know, from an academic perspective. And of course, some companies are uh, investing. Uh, I see here some kind of like uh, uh, resources. And the last thing that I want to talk about is probably the most beautiful thing at deep learning is the generative models. Um, you know, we, I talked before about, you know, starting with images and getting into vectors. And at some point I mentioned, well, you can actually take the vectors and generate images. And in some cases that vector can be just random noise. These are called generative models. And uh, these are all kind of like old, you can find much higher quality right now. Uh, these are all, you know, synthetic images. Um, uh, these are kind of like the the first papers five, six years ago, um, there's so much on that, it's a booming area. You know, it deserves probably a course on its own, not just an hour. And um, um, I just mentioned the, the way that you train it is that uh, you use a generator that it, in the beginning it generates, you know, probably garbage, and then you have real images, and then you have a discriminator that the discriminator, uh, you train it to understand whether the image that you're giving is uh, synthetic or real, okay? So in the beginning, the discriminator will do pretty well because whatever you generate over here, it's gonna be garbage, so it's pretty easy. And then what happens is that uh, you start retraining your generator in such a way that it's trying to fool the discriminator. So by trying to fool the discriminator, it actually learns how to generate realistic images. And, uh, you know, we mentioned before, you can start with text, create a vector, and then from a vector go to the mean image and the other way around. And the kind of like last thing, you can go to this website. This is a network called pix 2 pix where you can actually create a sketch of a cat and it can generate a cat, okay? Or you can create a sketch of a facade of a building and it can generate a building. And with that, I would like to finish my presentation, just being only three minutes late. Uh, thank you for attending. I'll be very happy to take questions. Um, that's okay. We only lost 20 people in one hour. <laughs> yeah, that's that's and a few just jumped, dropped off too. So it was relatively um, pretty static, the number of people there. Um, there are two questions in the Q&A log. So the one, and this is related to um, your malware example you know, around the segmentation techniques. So basically the question was by Ismail, you know, is this similar to dropout? And then, you know, basically is this trick in the algorithm to see if they look at the right place? So they're kind of like related in a sense. Dropout um, is trying to prevent overfitting. Okay. So in a sense, you know, um, Let's say that a network, if, you, if you're not careful, we learn pretty much uh, uh, the, the training set. So if you overfit, you build a classifier that can separate pretty well whether something is from the training or the test set, <laughs> okay? So in a sense, the dropout is actually trying, to, is helping you to learn the true thing. So it's actually trying to avoid overfitting and it's trying to make sure that, you know, whether something is from the training or the test set, the 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 um, the model or the the network cannot tell about that. Okay, so yes, in a sense, dropout is a very very primitive form of um, of learning the right thing. 
but at a very lower level, no, not at the semantic level, okay? Now, all these techniques that I mentioned about interpretability, they're actually trying to make sure that you're learning the right semantic thing. You know, you're not learning the sky, you're learning the, the dog, okay? So that's a good observation. Great. Um, another question, this, is, this came further back in the um, presentation, but so the question is, are there any disadvantages of using backpropagation algorithms to train a model? Uh, you know, people have tried everything like greedy training. Um, I, I've seen some recent uh, papers where they talk about uh, um, alternatives. So here's the thing. There's two things like back propagation as a way like, you know, so back propagation is a way of accelerating gradient descent. Okay. Mm -hmm. So some people claim that you can actually train neural networks without gradient descent or different um, um, you know, different variations of that. Uh, I find it very hard, like people have tried, they're unable to beat it. Now there are some other techniques of computing the gradients more efficiently, okay? But uh, I wanna say that backpropagation is kind of like the most, one of the most uh, robust and stable features of deep learning in the past 30, 40 years. Very few things have changed in backpropagation. Mm -hmm. So another question here from Talha is, do, nor, do neural networks perform better at simple binary classification problems than older techniques? Uh, that's a tricky question. It depends yeah. on the data. If it's, uh, if it's images, I want to say no. Mm -hmm. Generally, for tabular data, you know, traditional things you're going to use from uh, like credit low and applications and things like that, where you just have categoricals and numbers. Uh, actually boost tends to be like for the type of data you see in a Kaggle competition boosted trees tend to be the perform the best um, really really the power of deep learning comes where your data are semantically very heavy like they carry a lot of information so mm -hmm. and of course there's not too much noise and that's another thing um, that's kind of like I think I didn't mention the reason why deep learning didn't perform well in the beginning was because uh, most of the companies were working around like add data uh, or recommendations that they tend to be very noisy and uh, you know there's not really that much to learn so logistic regression was perfectly fine mm -hmm. yeah I'd, I'd say I'd actually agree entirely with that and a lot of times I like to start with simple traditional methods and then work your way towards the neural mm -hmm. networks and deep learning um, so John Tardy asks did you say that deep learning generally requires less compute resources than machine learning? Oh, no, I don't think I, don't think I said that. <laughs> I, I think it's the, the opposite. Yeah. Uh, you'd be surprised. One of the complaints by academics is that, you know, that's not fair. You know, Google publishes a paper, and if you want to reproduce it, yeah, you have to spend like $100,000 on cloud time to, to run it. That's what I You don't have the budget. Compute yeah. is still expensive. Yeah, exactly. But um, yeah, definitely, definitely uh, more expensive there. Uh, another question here, what are the main areas of research in computer vision right now, computer vision? Yeah, well, definitely the, the generative models, but uh, you know, basically synthesizing um, uh, you know, images. But uh, I think the hottest topic right now is visual question answering. So I'm giving you uh, an image and I'm, you know, like the, the, the one that has a lot of application is trying to find the people, annotate them, segment them, you know, I have a fridge, I have a person. Uh, but the most even advanced thing is like uh, asking logical questions. Um, you know, is there, uh, like I'm just, there's, there's a data set called the clever and the clever, you know, um, uh, you can ask a question, where is the red sphere? And you can say the red sphere is like below the red sphere or what is the object that it's next to a green object or how many green spheres do I have over here? Or how many spheres do I have that they are smaller than the rectangles that they are on top? Like think about any logical uh, expression you wanna ask uh, and try to make inferences about that, mm -hmm. you know? So that's, that's a whole area. Reasoning, like reasoning on top of images. Mm -hmm. um, so a question is by Benjamin Boer, 
do you know any of uh, do you know of any popular approaches to apply deep learning techniques on embedded um, like hardware constrained systems? Oh yeah, that's a very, um, I, I think it's called, uh, it's called tiny ML. If you go to new reaps or ICML and you see the workshops, you see they're yeah. called tiny AI, AI or tiny ML. There are workshops over there about uh, embedded machine learning or embedded AI as they call it. Uh, you know, with the IOTs right now, that's very hot. You know, in fact, even TensorFlow, when it came out, it had a version for running on, on, on cell phones or embedded devices. I think it's called TinyML or TinyAI. You will find a lot of resources on this workshop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, I, I'll send a link out um, after I'm done with these questions. So another question was, so there's questions on, this one's a personal one. So how do you use deep learning at relational AI? <laughs> That's right. So as a VP of data science, um, we have uh, a, a lot of customers, like uh, I'm responsible for delivery for, for consulting projects. So we use them a lot in, uh, you know, recommendations um, and search uh, vision. Um, we have several customers actually in, in, in computer vision. Um, now, if you're asking what model I'm using, definitely a lot of uh, uh, segmentation models and uh, uh, object detection when it comes to, to, to vision, when it comes to recommendations. Uh, we also try simple algorithms, but there are some um, uh, new techniques with uh, graph neural networks. But if you're asking me kind of like the process, how I'm using them, is that I think about the problem, I think about the architecture, you know, I'm putting my Legos together. Uh, if it's something simple, we make it quickly and care us. If other people, chances are, and that's kind of like a good thing to do, is if this is a standard problem, we're looking at the literature, finding the papers um, uh, that are closest to that, uh, pick the ones that they have code. Uh, you know, again, don't forget, unfortunately, I'm VP of data science, not VP of machine learning or VP of AI. I have to do things quickly. You know, they do give me the option to and the time to work with conferences. I, I review papers every year at uh, New Rips and ICML to keep myself up to date. But the, the pipeline, the process is think about the problem. If it's easy, code it yourself. If it's not that easy and requires more, more experiment, find what the industry has done, what, what you can find in, in, in papers, find the code. If the code is decent, start running it, you know, do any tweaks you need to do. Um, and then, you know, create results like in, in a few, I never work on a problem uh, longer than, if I haven't solved it in eight to 12 weeks, then we move to something new. The customers mm -hmm. always wanna see some improvement in eight or to 12 weeks. Yeah, and I'd say I'm the, in the same position where it, we're both customer facing, where you know we don't have the luxury of doing deep research projects, we're solving business problems. So the fastest way to solution um, typically is beneficial for everyone. Well, you know, I, also for that reason, uh, but that's, that's one of the reasons why I like working with interns every year, you know, I get to publish something through the interns. Well, something else I didn't mention that we're using a lot is, you know, we use a lot of knowledge graphs. I kind of like forgot about that. Knowledge graphs where, uh, for example, um, trying to uh, take information from the web and create uh, uh, relationships. Uh, mm -hmm. link information together. That's also uh, uh, a lot of, of work uh, that, that we're doing with customers, you know, building knowledge graphs. That's, that's one of the things. That's why we're called relational AI. We're building relations you know, uh, between entities. Mm -hmm. So I, we have two more questions. Actually, there's one question in the chat that I'm going to ask. Um, and then we'll get into like, what's the best place to get started. But a uh, more technical question from Al Mercado. With forecasting, you see um, long-term, short-term memory algorithms being used, but how has that evolved recently with frameworks like SageMaker and their deep AR algorithm? So, you know, SageMaker is a framework for deploying machine like networks. So I don't understand exactly what you mean by this. Is around, um, I'm not familiar with the deep AI. I'm thinking questions around their automated machine learning solutions. Oh, uh, okay. I think I know what you he means. So yeah. I, I, the deep AI is probably the Amazon uh, forecasting uh, API. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's what it is, deep auto regress, if I, if I remember correctly. So, you know, we actually looked at it. Um, it's a great model. The problem is that it's given to you as a black box. And, um, yeah. you know, if, you know, in some cases, yes, your problem could be that uh, I want to forecast uh, how many customers are going to have in my restaurant, uh, uh, you know, next week. But um, that has moderate value. Uh, you know, people usually are looking into the demand drivers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sometimes, you know, the nice thing about deep learning is you can run the optimization, uh, you know, in reverse order. So if there's any parameters in the features that you control, which is, you know, specials that I'm going to write, you know, uh, if let's say who is whoever is working, it, it kind of reminds me of a problem we had in the past trying to forecast for restaurants. And there were some parameters that you were controlling, like how many servers you're having, if these servers are working well together. And um, they wanted to build a demand forecaster, but they also wanted to run rev in the reverse order to say, well, find me, you know, what kind of specials do I have to run that day and uh, who I should put to work in order to maximize my, my profit, my revenue. By that, you can't really do it on deep, on deep AR. So yeah. it would have been much better if there were more hooks uh, into, you know, into getting the demand drivers and the interpretability and if you could run it the, the other way around. Yeah, um, I'd, say, I'd say it's, it's if you want to prove value really fast, it's a great tool. But with that value, there's the limitations. So it's a good introduction to prove value. And then you, if you really want to have more complex, like that was a great example with the restaurants and being able to have control of your parameters, interpretability into the, the model itself, then you, you, you slowly move away from what would be like your deep AR. Yeah, and a quick and dirty solution would be use it, uh, take these predictions and use them as a feature to your model. Mm -hmm. That's another way of doing it. Yeah, absolutely. Cool. Well, these next two questions are um, around just kind of getting started. So first from Yoon Zhu, um, she asks, I am a beginner of ML and wondering where to start with deep learning. Um, Edge Metric provides opportunities to everybody. Should one start with the basics of machine learning um, or should you jump directly into deep learning because it is the future? So here's the thing. Um, is I always like working on something. Um, uh, go directly to something practical. So go to Udemy or Coursera, take a course to learn um, deep learning um, because it does work. And, uh, and as you're doing that, you're gonna come up with some um, uh, concepts like you know, linear algebra and optimization, things like that, that you probably, you, you're gonna treat them as tools um, and then start reading, like after you, you understand how these things are working together, find the concepts that they're fundamental and you don't really understand, but they're more mathematical and go back and start reading about them. Okay. Um, it's more like a, 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 a top down and not a bottom up. You know, this is, it has to do with learning, like the traditional German way, school of learning, like the way that people used to learn math a mm -hmm. hundred years ago was we start from set theory, uh, theorems, corollaries, theorem, corollaries, you know, until we get to the practical application. The problem is that people get bored. So I can start, you know, teaching you calculus, linear algebra, theorem, you know, singular value decompositions until we get to deep learning. So I prefer the, the top bottom approach where I go straight to the application to get inspired, to understand, you know, to know where I'm, where I'm heading, what I need to solve and then start you know, everything that you don't understand, go one step down recursively and, and go closer to the bottom of the fundamental principles. And there's lots of nice books uh, that they, they follow this, um, um, this approach. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of this practice, but it will give you an edge. Like, you know, you can always stay on the application side and don't never learn the fundamentals. Uh, but I think uh, it is very, very important to um, to know them. It gives you a much, uh, you know, a, a, a competitive advantage. In fact, I've been struggling. This is a book that I've been trying to write. I even promised that one publisher and they keep chasing me. Uh, the title was How to Code a Paper. And the idea was, 
you start, you know, implementing the, the ideas and everything that comes up, you know, what is gradient descent, what's optimization, uh, start un unrolling the resources and, uh, uh, you know, teaching you machine learning in the reverse way and not the forward way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's in the to-do list. Yeah, it's, it's not gonna happen during COVID. <laughs> you should have time to write. <laughs> um, it's similar along those lines. I think it's gonna be the same answer, but in case you do have any more insights, and I have a thought on this as well, but um, the question from uh, Jean-Paul is, where would be the best place to start as a developer? So coming in with a developer background. So he is a developer, he wants to learn AI or he wants to learn how to develop, uh, he wants to become a developer. Can we clarify that? I, I, I'm assuming, and I don't know the full concept, but I'm assuming wants to learn AI, at, is a developer now and wants to dive into AI. Okay, this is the best case scenario, you know. Um, developers are smart, software engineers, um, I have a great respect for them, okay? Uh, they're very disciplined, they're very smart, they're hands-on. And uh, 10 years ago, when I was starting my career in Atlanta, uh, you know, data science talent was scarce. And my suggestion was, give me your best developers and, you know, within months, I can train them to become data scientists. Okay, so the good news is you have very strong and solid foundation. Um, uh, again, there are courses. Um, uh, that they are, all of them are hands-on with Python uh, notebooks that you can take. Uh, there's also Kaggle. As I said, you know, Kaggle is a very good school of learning how to um, win competitions. Like they, uh, they provide a very good, a nice, uh, uh, rigorous cookbook. Um, it, it gives the idea that it's hack. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a collection of hacks, but you know, after you learn these hacks, you can actually understand scientifically why they work. So Kaggle is a, is, a, is a good place to start. But I think if you are a developer, if you take any of these courses, there are some uh, amazing courses, like, you know, there's Andrews and Z class, the very famous Coursera uh, course with hundreds of thousands of, of students every year. Uh, Open EDX, Udacity, they have brilliant courses. Um, you know, the other way that you can do it is by deciding how to build an application. So Think about an application, an app that you want to build, and uh, try to find out uh, public APIs like you know, like Core ML and uh, other libraries that they implement them, and trying to use them as a black box, to, a black box to make something. And after you make that something, then start reading or taking courses about okay, this thing is using uh, object detection. How the hell does object detection work? Okay, that would be my suggestion. But if you are, and also go and talk to your boss if you're a developer and tell, uh, talk to me. You know. But there's actually there's blog posts that they talk about that the best way if you can hire a data scientist is repurpose your developers. Yep, I'd, I'd say you you have a head start already. Um, and too many times tonight, especially on my team, are we we need the developer skills to augment very well with our data science expertise and the data science portion of it is almost easier to learn unless you want to get deep, deep into the theories as I'm sure Nick has, <laughs> but um, yeah. So it can be picked up for sure. Mm -hmm. um, so we're coming up kind of on time here. There's one more question that just came in from Nima and I'm going to close the door on questions after this. Sorry, but Nima, you're the lucky last one. Um, the question here is what are some of the most successful ways that deep learning can be used in large scale recommender systems? And it's a great segue into our sixth session, but I'll, I'll let Nick tech on it. I want to say we got Khalif over there, over here, who's the director of sets and accommodation at, uh, at Home Depot. So, um, you know, he has some uh, <laughs> success stories to, <laughs> to yeah. share if you, <laughs> um, if you want, but, um, well, you know, first of all, people don't know, there's a very, very nice book called The Everything Store, which talks about Amazon. And people might not know, but uh, when Amazon launched recommendation, they increased the revenues by 33%. Okay, so recommendations do matter. Um, in terms of uh, uh, success stories, deep learning and success stories, uh, you know, we do have uh, some customer stories where we've seen uh, 
a very big uh, lift okay by applying uh, deep learning models um and um now i don't know if i want to go to details but definitely that paper that you saw from uh, from youtube um youtube is also so big lift uh well pretty much they're pretty much uh, um you know a lot of success stories of, of deep learning in recommendation now in the beginning it took some time um uh, there wasn't a big delta like uh, some traditional models still work uh, really well but we have a paper under submission right now where we actually um, uh, talk about this uh, a lot of uh, experimental analysis uh, definitely rex is, is a conference if i believe you're talking about recommendation you you Nima, you must talk know about rexis you can find a lot of information um I want to say that makes a big difference in, in personalization and when it comes to fusing a lot of different, maybe I should, uh, when it comes to fusing a lot of uh, different sources. Like, uh, okay, we see over here where, at, uh, you know, in order to recommend something, they really want to see your history, your search query, where you are your age, your gender, blah, 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 in order to make these recommendations. These are things that would be very difficult to do with uh, traditional models, you know. So it's, it's going to behave better, not because it's, it's deeper or fancier, but because it can fuse information that, uh, you know, simple collaborative filtering won't be able to ingest all these different modes of modalities of data. You can even Put the picture of the user if you if you want <laughs> over here. I'm pretty sure you can. Of course, you, if, uh, you have to be careful because you might create biases over there. Mm -hmm. Different story. But you can put the picture of the image just to be sure. Okay. Great. Yeah, and I, I'd say that is a, definitely tune in two Wednesdays from now because we will be doing an hour and a half deep dive into that topic where I believe Khalifa is the presenter. I'm not, I can't confirm that, but I, I think he is. <laughs> okay, so I shouldn't really <laughs> talk more about that, still the glory, but I'm pretty sure, as I said, Khalifa can tell you more about Yeah, uh, recommendations. Yes, uh, yeah, next case. Session, session is on the, um, in July, I believe. Yeah, the first week of July. And it's July 1st, I believe. Yeah. And it's going to be about uh, some of the uh, applications or some of the uh, techniques that we use, the recommendations. We're going to uh, present some of the successful stories of using deep learning and machine learning and recommendations, which, as Nick said, like we partner with him and his team in building many of those models for our recommendation engine. So, see you at that. Uh, mm -hmm. yep. Great. Well, with that, um we'll stop here we're kind of over time but i appreciate it nick incredible presentation i learned a lot especially about the history and kind of the evolution of machine learning so i appreciate it we still have 54 people on have been listening to the questions so thank you everyone who stayed on past seven o'clock um and i hope you enjoyed the content we'll see you next week thank you for hosting me guys thank you very much